Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that as men we have woken and you have allowed us to come that we might seek your face this early this morning in your precious word. We don't know what this week holds, but we know that you hold it. And that should be enough for us to trust. The old song, Trust and Obey, for there is no other way for us to live in Christ Jesus. We have all that we need. All that we need to live the Christian life. For you have provided for it. That's why you command us to do things. Whatever you require, you have provided. Teach us. Teach us as men to rely upon you. Teach us to weigh heavy upon you, God. Caution us that we're too self-sufficient as men. Help us to say that we are weak, that we might lean upon you that much more. For wherein we are weak, you become strong if we would trust and wait upon you. Pray for each man and where they are in their Christian walk that you would visit, Lord, and that you would cause us to be ones that would anticipate and, and evaluate where we are in our Christian walk and that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you and that each man here would live for eternity. That eternity would be in their thoughts today, Lord so that we may live different down here. This place, we say often, is not our home, but we often don't want to go home. Help us to have the longing of home so that we might live here and walk with the beat of a different drummer. Wherever their battle is, Lord, whatever temptations that are theirs, come, Lord, and work for your glory. We entrust these things into your hands, God. May the Holy Spirit this, this morning be powerfully moving among us for the glory of your name. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're in Romans chapter 14. And you may say, well, we, are we ever going to get out of chapter 14? But let's look at the latter part of Romans 14, beginning with verse 13 through 23, where we are going to find five important principles of our Christian liberty. Romans 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather... Determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way, serves Christ, is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat, or to drink wine, to do anything but by which your brother stumbles. 
the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Yes, it is, isn't it? It, it? it is. It is. Thank you. Well, the background that we have here, for those of you who are new to the study, is that we started in Romans chapter 12 with the practical aspects of Romans. Doctrinal from chapters 1 through 11. That's why he ends with such doxology at the end of chapter 11. And beginning with chapter 12, he says... Uh, I urge you, therefore, since we have all this doctrine that we have, let's now live in a certain way. So he admonishes them in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, which is absolutely crucial if we're going to do, and our, uh, which he is commanding us to do in the rest of the book. And that deals with the lordship of Christ. If you're not submitting to the lordship of Christ, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is your reasonable service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Nothing can be said, nothing can be done in the rest of the chapter of the book of Romans unless we are reminded of that truth. If we are not placing that on the line, then... We can't do what God is telling us to do in the rest of Romans. So he begins with that admonishment, uh, that placing our lives as a sacrifice unto God. I hope you have done that. It's often called the Lordship of Christ. God, you got it all. It's like standing at the altar and you said, I do. Well, when you said, I do, you're continuing to say, I do. You have to continue to renew that thought and that commitment down through the ages. Now, then in chapter 12, he talks about the relationship to the church. Then he talked about the relationship to society at the end of chapter 12. He talks about the relationship to the government in our society. And we spend a lot of time on that. And then in the relationship to other believers, and that's what we're on right now. It all stems back to that command in Romans chapter 12. We have been talking about this relationship with other believers, and I've been using a term called the gray area. That's a terminology. If you don't know what I mean by that, then you, don't, you can have a misunderstanding of what I'm trying to say. Outside this, what I call, gray area are the stated commands of God. They're not gray at all. We call those black and white. Uh, that every Christian must obey. It is wrong to put God's explicit commands under the new covenant in the gray area. Likewise, it is just as wrong to make, a, uh, to, to make a freedom in the gray area a command of God for everyone. You become a legalist then. So what is the gray area? Freedom we have that we may or may not do. However, these freedoms may at times become sin in certain situations. In the gray area, some Christians will have the freedom to do certain things that others are not able to do. We must not judge each other in the gray areas. Okay? For those who have been with me, that is a review. Those new, hopefully you have it. If you do not understand what I just said here, you can misunderstand what Paul says and what I am trying to say, hopefully what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 14. Now, 
I find in verses 13 through 23 of Romans 14, uh, five principles which we as Christians are responsible to exercise our liberty because of their love for the weaker brother. Okay, Let's look at the first principle and I, in verses 13 and verse 14, and it I have summarized is this. Love forbids us from hindering and causing a brother to stumble. Don't use your freedom and say, well, I'm free to do this that causes a weaker brother to stumble. Then you're not using your freedoms correctly. I, what we're going to see is that the burden is always on the mature. So you say you're mature. That you have freedoms that you, have, you can do. Okay, well then there is responsibilities in exercising those freedoms so that you don't cause others to stumble. So, look at verse 13. It sums up um, chapters 4, 14 through 1 through 12, when it says, Therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block uh, in the brother's way. A stronger brother, we could say sisters, but since we're brethren here, bro, men, uh, who by God's grace understands his liberty should not regard with contempt those who are weak. The weaker brother should not judge the liberty of the stronger brother, but Paul tells us not to do this because in Romans 14, 10 through 12, it says, we all will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ. They don't, they don't, you shouldn't judge another brother because you're not Christ in this area. Now, on the opposite side, we can, when somebody says, you tell a brother or, uh, that the word of God says you are not to do this, there is a tendency for them to say, well, don't judge me, brother. And you should say, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now, that's outside the gray area, right? That's not in the gray area. Because in the gray area, there is freedom. But outside that, when you say something to a brother about what God's Word says, and you be careful here because you're entering into temptation, they may say, well, don't judge me. That's incorrect. Your response should be lovingly, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. But in the gray area, there is freedom. As long as I do not cause somebody to stumble in their Christian life because they're not strong in the Lord. Notice, the burden is on the mature. Okay? So, let's not put a stumbling block, an obstacle in a brother's way. Now, what is an obstacle or a stumbling block? Well, it's some kind of barrier which hinders progress. We would call them, <clears throat> in the physical world, a speed bump, right? Or a dip that they don't see that could cause damage, right? Because they didn't slow down. Uh, a stumbling block, a snare, a trap, something that would stop progress in their Christian life. I don't want to be an obstacle that would cause them to have trouble. I don't want to be a stumbling block that would cause them not to continue in their Christian life because of what? Because of my freedom. Okay. Now, there are at least two kinds of weaker brothers take this from Aldridge, a lifestyle of evangelism. There are probably more. You could probably uh, define this more. But there is what he calls a professional weak brother, and then there is a susceptible weak brother. When, I, when he uses the word professional weak brother, it, he's basically talking about somebody who's a legalist. One, 
who's judging in the gray area, and you say, well, is this an obstacle for you? Is this a stumbling block for you? Oh, no, I would never do that. Well, you just ran into a legalist. He may not know it, but he can cause problems in the church because he's now taking something in the gray area and making it absolute for everybody. And in the gray area, you can't do that. Then there is the, uh, that person you need to be concerned with, uh, it may be that I would restrict my freedom at this moment because of him, because I don't want to cause uh, division among the group at this moment but I would want to be able to talk to that brother and be able to hopefully help him to see these things. Because if you don't, then it's going to be causing a problem. And in a church where a person becomes more of a problem, then the elders have to get involved because it's causing division in the church. Now, that's another thing. But here, uh, we hopefully will be able to say, you know, I may restrict my freedom because of a legalist at the moment, but we would want to try to help that person to see what the problem is and that he shouldn't be doing that. But on the other hand, what we would call a susceptible weak brother, a weak brother that looks up to you, and his conscience won't allow him to do something, and he violates his conscience because you have freedom, but he doesn't. Well, but <clears throat> you doing that now has caused him to be susceptible to not growing or being confused or stopped in his growing because his conscience is being violated by doing his action in that gray area. Are you with me? So we have to discern in some ways between a weak brother that is susceptible and a weak brother that's professional, in other words, a legalist. Both need to be taken care of in, in biblically, but I may restrict my freedoms, especially to the weaker brother. All right. Um, the stronger believer should be willing to restrict his freedom in love because of the weaker brother. And then in verse 14, in the gray area, nothing is unclean unless your conscience says it's unclean. Verse 13 adds that in love we don't cause an obstacle or a hindrance in a weaker brother's life. So what are we learning? In this gray area... I need to make sure that I don't put an obstacle or a hindrance in somebody's life. And secondly, it, is my conscience okay in doing this? Now you take these principles outside the gray area into the commands that are said that you've got to do, and everything's a problem on that. So just don't take these outside the gray area. All right. any, pro any, any problems in principle number one? Okay, <clears throat> if it's outside the gray area, which this is not talking about. This is talking about the principles in the gray area. And I've been moving inside and outside the gray box. Outside the gray box, we got to do it because it's a command of God. Inside the gray box are freedoms that we may or may not do because of certain circumstances. Uh, no, it's not. It's not easy. But you know what? 
That's the problem that we find in our churches and among our, our groups. And if we if you don't know these principles, how in the world can we how, how in the world can we uh, treat each other in love? I find personally that this is not taught. And so what, since it's not taught, everybody has a lot of problems in the church. We, may, we can still have problems knowing these principles. John? Yes. I, I ran into a situation a couple of years ago where one of my Christian friends was a dynamic sports fan. Yes. Okay. There's not a few of those around here. Yes. We have to be careful of when we talk to others that feel like they are doing what they feel God is leading them to do alone. Yeah. Chapter 14, verse 5 there, it talks about days. You regard one day than another, that's fine. Now, there is a principle outside the gray area in what we have to do, according to Hebrews chapter 10, do not forsake your assembly together. It didn't say that you had to come every Sunday and this, that, and the other. We are not to forsake the assembly together. In other words, uh, 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 in my freedom, uh, make sure I'm assembling together. That has to be because that's a command from Scripture. But now we're not under the Sabbath concept because Paul couldn't say, if you regard one day more than another, that's fine, but don't put that on somebody else. If the Sabbath was in vogue, uh, as a command under the new covenant, he couldn't say that. But he does say that. So it shows you that the Sabbath was not, you don't have to do it. If you want to call it a Sabbath and you want to, as an individual, uh, take it that way, you have the freedom to do that. Just don't put it on somebody else. But everybody in the New Testament needs not to forsake the assembly together because that's a command from Holy Writ. That's outside the gray box. Okay? You see how we need to think? Hopefully. That's correct. That's correct. I mean... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They have the freedom. They have the freedom to do that. But uh, they can't say we're we're doing it correct and everybody's doing it wrong. And I'm sure they're not saying that. Because they're reading, you know, reading the zip. But if they did, then they would be wrong. Since they don't do that, they have freedom to do that. Same thing with God's holy laws. Yeah, we, we don't have to do them, but you can if you want to. To meet so that you might be able to reach Jewish people for Christ. Yeah, you have the freedom to do that. But I can't put that on everybody.
Uh huh. Yeah, well, there, there's where th these people are, are taking things in the gray area and making them commands that the scripture doesn't command. Now, there are times when taking alcohol would be sin because you would cause a younger brother to stumble or that if you took in excess which scripture specifically says it would be wrong. But whether you play cards or dominoes, it, in the scriptures, it doesn't say. Now, if it begins, there's, you know, we can start adding, well, if it, if it controls my life and therefore uh, I am controlled by playing dominoes and this, that, and the other, well, specifically, you got a problem. But it's not because of dominoes. So we're, these are the kinds of questions, these are the kinds of situations that cause problems that Paul is dealing with in Romans 14. Whether it's in the gray area or outside of it. And we need to discern it and then we as mature believers need to make sure we don't cause people to, to stumble who can't make these decisions who are weak or not knowledgeable so that we might be able to bring them up to speed i if if you understand these principles you can have great freedom but be careful with your freedom that you don't disturb the assembly because well i got freedom to do it i can do it well, if I'm causing a problem, I need to, as a mature Christian, I need to restrict my freedoms until people get to understanding. Because not doing that is not acting in love. Okay. Yeah, Rudy. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. First Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine. Excellent passage. It goes right along with what we're doing here on that. So first principle, love forbids us from hindering and causing a brother to stumble. I don't want to do that in what we are calling the gray area. Okay? Principle number two, yeah, John. One, one other thing, uh, one of the things that I, I saw John was uh, earlier this morning about this, because Christ talks about this also. Because what we're talking about, Paul is trying to get us to grow spiritually. Yes. in verse 19 it says whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments <coughs> and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven and uh, but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven and <coughs> I, I kind of refuse to do what these men do that Yes. But we still don't lose our salvation no matter what. Sin is horrible and we don't want to commit it. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make us grow 
Jersey is a slice of steak no matter what. You still are. You believe in greed. Yeah. You're going to make it. Yeah. And I think we have to con- continually know that. Because sometimes I think we tend to uh, come against those that are doing wrong in a sort of sinning. And, and so you're not even going to make it. <laughs> Yes, God's going to persevere in you. The God of perseverance will persevere on that. But he's trying to teach us principles. And the second principle that has to be done, again, uh, under the Lordship of Christ, is that love forbids us from hurting or destroying uh, our weaker brother. So back in chapter 14... Verse 15, for if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Now you can substitute the word food there with a bunch of words, can't you? Different kinds of things. Not just food with your actions with all that you're doing that's in the gray area. Are you with me? He just happens to be talking about food because it it has a big deal with the Jewish community. So the word hurting there may be translated grieve. You're not to hurt. You're not to grieve a brother. And we're not to injure our fellow uh, believer in the Lord. Now, it also says there in this text, do not destroy our brother. Now, this phrase is used by some to try to prove that a believer can lose his salvation by destroying him. Um, So you might find somebody trying to take you to this text to show you that you can lose your salvation. What would you say? You would say, wait a minute, Paul's not talking about eternal salvation he's talking about sanctification he's talking about how you live not how whether you get in or not so first of all the context should tell you that and we know that the scripture is replete with uh, evidence that a truly saved man will never lose his salvation we don't even have to get out of romans right Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. What can separate us from the love of Christ? He says, nothing. So, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. So this word destroy is used in some context, if you do a word study, for eternal destruction. But the context here is not eternal life, but the spiritual life. Our actions should not lead another to moral and spiritual decline by leading him or encouraging him to violate his conscience in what we are calling the gray area. Everybody all right? Yes, Sam. Well, if both of them are believers, then we this information applies. If one of them is not a believer, then we're not we can't apply this because it doesn't apply to unbelievers. Are you with me? So, but if you if Well, what I'm saying is that situation could be complicated with another question or two. But if, if that's why I'm saying, I can't, I, you know, I can only tell you, I've learned over the years when people give me hypotheticals, I have to go back to specific principles of Scripture. If they are believers, then this passage applies to them because it deals with believers. If they are not, 
and just churchgoers and not true believers, then this passage does not apply to them. Other passages would apply. But you could still cause uh, somebody to stumble uh, who is an unbeliever. You don't want to do that either. We got passages that would be involved with that. So remember, this is talking about believers in a particular situation called our freedom, the gray area. Do you see why I have to go so slow? Because we want to make sure we understand what we're saying. And Paul's second point here is don't destroy your brother. Did you know you could destroy a brother? You couldn't, he won't lose his salvation, but you could cause him to spin out, of, out and just be completely um, ruined for a period of time in his Christian life because you and I exercised a freedom. So it's always we as mature believers are ones that have to be careful how we use our freedom. We can't say, well, I'm free to do that. I can do that what I want to. Well, yeah, yeah, but you got to be discerning. Well, it, it, first of all, it all depends on what relationship you have with them. If you don't have a relationship with them, it's very difficult. If you have a relationship with them, it's likely that you, they look to you as the mature one because of who you are. And that is the time when they'll probably ask you, start asking you some questions. And these are the things that you then would begin to help them with. Remember, you need to tell him, just because you see me do something in this gray area, as you've already explained it, he understands it, doesn't mean that you have the faith to do it. Your conscience may not allow you to do it. And then you could switch the road. You may have the freedom to do this, and it would be just fine, but I won't. If it does, then I'm using my freedoms in the wrong way. So, am, brothers, do you see how you have to discern what you do and when you do it? You say you're a mature believer. You need to be very careful how you use your freedom, that we don't use it to cause others to fall or to be hindered in their Christian life. That demonstrates how much we ha have uh, uh, should be walking in love. It's not walking in love when you cause somebody to just be, I don't understand, and just be completely, uh, I've seen it uh, as a pastor, um, how people not understanding these prim principles can cause conflict within a church. That's why I revel at teaching these things because it helps that we may walk in love. So, principle number two, love forbids us from hurting or destroying our weaker brother. Okay, so do you, do you need to be careful when you say you're going to go do something? Yeah, you do. And the more you are considered to be mature, the more you're going to have to. All right? And if you don't, you're demonstrating to me and to others <clears throat> that you're not as mature as you think you are. Is it still still okay with the gun and the gun danger? Well, let's say it another way. <laughs> let's say that we should judge everything by the Word of God. So I want to take any situation and I want to be able to know the Word and discern what the Word of God says so that I might be able, hopefully, to be consistent 
in walking in the truth and in my freedom. I just, I just complicated the spiritual life for you, didn't I? But do you see, you don't have to answer it, but just think, if you didn't know these principles before we've been talking about them now, do you think you might be causing some problems and you didn't even know it? You're saying, well, I can do that. I have freedom to do that. What's wrong with them? Well, you say you're mature, huh? You, you're acting like it. You're saying you are. You use that as an understanding of these things. You need to be careful then how you walk among others who don't have that understanding. All right. Um, we should walk in love, not in selfishness and in pride, which destroys other people. Uh, I th when I think I'm doing pretty good in the Christian life, I just go to 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and read what love does. Should we do that? I think we should right this moment. So hold your place here. Take, take, let us take it. Now, because this is going to mean something a little bit different for you, because you, all, you know this passage. You probably, some of you have probably memorized it. But now it's saying that you are to walk in love toward your brother who is maybe weaker. What does that mean? Well, let's come back to it. <clears throat> Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not uh, act unbecomingly. In other words, it doesn't cause to be rude. It does not seek its own. Hmm is not provoked. You don't provoke people by acting in love. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. You are tolerant to people. Does not rejoice in, unri in, in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It, it covers all things. Usually it says bears all things. I think that word there can mean covers. In other words, you don't get all upset. Okay, yeah, I cover that. It's okay, I'm not going to get offense. It covers all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And this is what he's saying. We are to walk in love. So in conclusion, the spiritual strong believer is the one who is humble, not asserting his or her rights, not insisting on his or her freedoms, not looking after his or her interest, but in the interest of others. And in this situation, in this context, this is love. Okay? So, love forbids us from hurting or destroying our weaker brother. The third principle. We won't finish this one. I'll come back to this, Lord willing, next week. But love behaves with Christian liberties and gives someone the chance to, to speak evil concerning you. Notice uh, um, verse 16 through 18. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness. I mean, he could have added a lot more to that, eating and drinking and going to this and doing this and doing that, but he's concentrating on that. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ, is acceptable to God and approved by men. So, what is he saying? The phrase spoken of as evil literally means blasphemy. Now, when you say it that way, you kind of, whoa, speaking of evil, not just speaking of evil, but blasphemy. So, what he says here, uh, 
don't have something that is good be spoken in blaspheme. That wouldn't be good. What kind of examples can you think of that will illustrate this? I'm making you think at the end, huh? Usually when I stop and do that, it's because we haven't thought about it. Okay? And we need to think about it. Using uh, this principle in verse 16, therefore do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as blasphemy or evil. Why? Because you didn't, you didn't do it right. What was good for you in the gray areas because you wouldn't consider and you caused all kinds of damage among the, 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 the believers because you as a mature person, I mean, if you're a mature person and a, and a younger immature believer does it, is that really going to cause you to have a problem? You're going to go, oh, man, how can I come by this brother and put my arm around him and, and talk about it? But it didn't cause you to have a problem in the sense that you were questioning it. So the kingdom of God, then, is not a squabble over liberty. It is, as verse 17 will say, it's righteousness, it's peace, and it is joy in the Holy Spirit. So what I do in <clears throat> the um, gray area should bring forth righteousness, it should bring forth peace, it should bring forth joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are pretty good things, aren't they? What she's going to say is that's that's what that's why that's what should be shown that you are part of the kingdom of God. That's the kind of life that you should display in the Holy Spirit. And uh, isn't Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-two and twenty-three, the fruit of the Spirit? And part of the fruit of the Spirit is peace, joy, righteous living. Yes. <clears throat> it uh, it all it, it that's a wisdom issue. Uh, it, it could possibly be that that could be done, or it it, it could be possible if you have a relationship with them, to be able to sit down and discuss it. See what I'm saying? If, if you, especially you, an older man and an elder in our church, to come to, to talk to somebody here is proper. I mean, you're an elder of the church. And you say, hey, I understand that you may have a little problem with what I did. I, I, I sure don't want to offend you. Let's talk about it. That would be proper. And maybe you can help them to see why you did what you did and it's, it is proper and be able to explain some of these principles to them. But there are times when you might, for example, some, you're, afraid that you, you're afraid that uh, you having a beer once in a while uh, uh, or a glass of wine may cause somebody to stumble so you just do it at home. So that, you know, don't have a problem. But it could be that they find out you did that and this, that, and the other. They need to be instructed. Now, just what I said could cause certain churches just to, to go ballistic. But there's nothing in the scripture says that we can't take alcohol. It just means when you do it, where you do it, and what, and does it do it in excess or not excess? We used to have the blue laws, didn't we, brother? 
I voted to stick, keep the blue laws because of certain Christian heritage, but I understood why they took them out. <laughs> but that's a, that's a question. For example, when I was a pastor, my wife and I decided that we would not take of any alcohol have it in the house. No, n- no one in the church told me that. No one in the church says you had to do that. But because I knew the climate that I was in, that I would not be able to minister to certain people because of that, I restricted my freedoms so that I might be able to minister to all. It was really nothing, because it's not a big deal for us. But it it was, I I wanted to, to make sure that was out of the way so that nothing, at least in that area, would cause a problem. Even though I would discuss the, the freedoms that a person has if they want it. I restricted my freedoms because of my decision, not anybody else's decision. So in that case, that's the situation that happened. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. I said, why do this uh, and have a possibility that certain people I'm not going to be able to minister to because they, they acted wrongly. So I, I'm not saying that this is what you have to do. I'm just telling you that that's what I did because I felt the freedom to do so. Others may have said, well, I'm not going to restrict my freedom and I'm going to teach this brothers or the, who have a problem this area. I taught on this area too, but I was trying to keep as many hindrances out of the way as I could. That was my decision, not that I'm making that a rule for somebody else. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. I pray that it's been edifying. I pray that it has been understood that we might walk in freedom that as Paul says here in uh, Romans 14, that it deals with the kingdom of God, which is righteousness and peace and uh, joy in the Holy Spirit. But that's why we do things, to bring forth your kingdom in the joy of walking with you. Help us, Lord, in these areas, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.